when we talk about uh, mesenteric ischemia, it may be either arterial or venous, and it may be either acute, acute on chronic or chronic. Today, I will be talking about acute mesenteric arterial diseases. The first description of uh, mesenteric vascular occlusion was by Benivine in the 15th century, and there were some sporadic case reports in literature by Tietman and Virchow. The first successful resection of an infarcted intestine was in 1895, and the first embolectomy of the SMA was performed in 1951. However, for the next few decades after that, mortality and morbidity was very high at 70 to 90 percent. It is only after the 1970s, with the liberal use of angiography and vasodilators used as adjuncts, that the mortality and morbidity has decreased to about 50%. Acute mesenteric ischemia is the abrupt reduction in or cessation of the delivery of oxygen to the intestine, which may be either due to an occlusion, which may be an embolus or a thrombus, or due to a hypoperfusion during shock. The frequency varies in acute abdominal cases, which ranges from 2.1% in suspected peritonitis to as high as 31% in non-trauma damage control laparotomies. A pathophysiological classification bases it into various categories, which may be occlusive, either due to an embolus or a thrombus, aortic dissection, either of the, all the visceral arteries or of isolated arteries, vascular trauma, arteriopathies, and non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia on OMI, which includes colonic ischemia after iota ILF surgery or abdominal compartment syndrome. Acute mesenteric ischemia carries with it a 60 to 70% morbidity and mortality rate, which has not changed for many decades in spite of aggressive treatment. Mortality rates, however, have shown to be a bit less in institutes where endovascular techniques are routinely used. Traditional treatment consists of surgical intervention with intensive medical support. And in non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia, the use of intervention options. Endovascular and hybrid procedures are also applied in well-selected patients. The incidence is not very common ranging from about 1 in 1,000 admissions, and risk factors include females, usually in the seventh decade of life, and the patients who have comorbid conditions, mainly like atrial presentation or flutter, recent cardiac events, CCF, and peripheral arterial emboli. Patients may also present in an acute on chronic mesenteric ischemia setting. When we talk about arterial embolism, first of all, we need to understand that irrespective of the cause, whether it is either an embolus or a thrombus, the infarction of the bowel is from mucosa outwards, which explains a lot of the signs and symptoms. In an embolism, the Virchow's triad comes into play with endothelial injury or dysfunction, hemodynamic changes, and hypercoagulability, all causing thrombosis. It is the most common type. Uh, accounting for about 40 to 50 percent of the cases, and mainly these are either thromboemboli or etheroemboli. The SMA is most commonly involved because of its wide caliber and narrow takeoff angle from the iota. The embolus lodges in the proximal part distal to the takeoff of the middle colic artery as the artery tends to taper at this point, thus, the duodenum and transverse colon are spared. Only a few emboli lodge in the proximal SMA. One third of all these patients who have an embolus usually have an antecedent embolic event, mainly due to a cardiac source. When arterial thrombosis <clears throat> is suspected, it is usually superimposed on an atherosclerotic plaque and is seen in about 25 to 30% of acute mesenteric ischemia patients. And many of these patients are asymptomatic. This is due to an insidious onset due to extensive collateralization and the maintenance of viability until the closure of the critically stenotic vessel or collateral. 
acute on chronic presentations are also common and patients present with abdominal pain, avoidance to food and weight loss. Complications of mesenteric revascularization can also lead to acute ischemia, endovascular failures, distal embolization, perforation of vessels, dissection, stent migration and thrombosis being some of the causes. The final common pathway of bowel ischemia is always the same. We should note that only one fifth of the bowel capillaries are open at any given point of time and normal oxygenation of the bowel is maintained at just 20% of maximal blood flow to the bowel. Intestinal mucosa can extract increasing amounts of oxygen during hypoperfusion. Prolonged ischemia leads to the disruption of this intestinal mucosal barrier, which leads to neutrophil activation and the release of reactive oxygen metabolites. Diagnostic evaluation Acute mesenteric ischemia is usually not initially included as a diagnosis in elderly patients with abdominal pain. When it is diagnosed, for 24 hours after the onset of symptoms, the survival is very low. Only about one third of patients are diagnosed before surgical exploration or bowel necrosis, indicating a delay in diagnosis. We should remember that a high index of suspicion based on history and physical examination is needed and prompt investigation is <clears throat> cornerstone to the treatment. We shall see that the diagnostic evaluation includes a good clinical history and examination, laboratory investigation, echocardiography, diagnostic imaging, which will include radiography and various other imaging modalities. Symptoms out of proportion with signs are usually how the patients present. Abdominal pain and tenderness with no peritoneal signs initially. However, this can lead to frank peritonitis when there is bowel gangrene and bowel rupture. An embolic episode has an abrupt presentation and the patient may have a forceful sudden bowel evacuation after the onset of pain. Thrombosis may have a subacute presentation as we said earlier, due to the presence of collaterals. Blood investigations show leukocytosis, lactic acidosis, amylacemia, and coagulopathy. The coagulopathy, however, worsens as the sepsis increases. Patients are usually um, dehydrated, with blood investigation showing hemoconcentration, leukocytosis, a high anion gap, and lactic acidosis. Need to assess the fluid status, electrolyte, and acid base balance of the patients. T dimer, usually within the first 24 hours of presentation, is more of an excluded test. The two specific blood investigations for intestinal ischemia are the intestinal fatty acid binding protein and the ideal bile acid binding protein. However, these are still not clinically used or significant. X-rays are usually normal and are the first line of investigation, mainly used to exclude other diagnosis and to check for free air under diaphragm. Though duplex ultrasound is accurately used to identify high-grade stenosis in an acute setting of mesenteric ischemia due to pain, user dependency and bowel gas is not of much use. High-resolution CT scan excludes or identifies various pathologies, including bowel infarction, by the presence of mural thickening, intraperitoneal fluid, pneumatosis, portal venous hair, and pneumoperitoneum. The arterial phase of the CT angiogram is used to diagnose ischemia, and a negative oral contrast like water before the scan helps to aid the diagnosis. A delayed phase, bowel wall enhancement, and also visualization of the phase is seen in a biphasic CT. A biphasic multi-detector CT angiography is 100% sensitive and almost 90% specific of acute mesenteric ischemia. There is no one diagnostic sign, but pneumatosis, SMA or celiac with IMA occlusion, arterial embolism, air in the arterial or venous system, venous thrombosis, 
solid organ infarction, bowel wall enhancement, air in the bowel wall or free air, and various other signs are all indicative of the diagnosis. Angiography is the most sensitive diagnostic modality and no flow in the SME short distance from the origin is known as the mercury menace sign. Lateral views are used to delineate the thrombus and in one third of patients, additional emboli can be identified on arteriography. Patients with strongly suspected non-obstructive mesenteric ischemia may benefit from direct arteriography as long as there is no immediate need for a laparotomy and the bowel viability is not in question. Nowadays, arteriography is used in conjunction with vasodilators, thrombolysis, and angioplasty with or without stenting. Arteriography followed by an open hybrid and a bowel exploration can also be done based on the clinical presentation of the patient. MR angiography does not have much of a role, even though it may have some <clears throat> advantages being non-invasive and non-nephrotoxic because of its lengthy procedure and need for post-processing, which is not ideal in an emergency setting. Diagnostic laparoscopy too has its disadvantages with its limited access, assess bowel viability and the walking bowel Serosyl color may be difficult to predict on laparoscopy. Laparoscopy in adjunct with dye and ultraviolet light may help delineate non-viable bowel, but is not widely used for the need of specialized equipment. The various recommendations that are seen in the ESVS guidelines is that in acute abdominal pain, a D-dimer measurement may be used to exclude the diagnosis of acute mesenteric ischemia. And in patients with suspected acute mesenteric ischemia, a triphasic CT iotogram with one millimeter slices to detect arterial occlusion may be done. Even in patients with elevated creatinine level, a risk can be taken in order to save the patient's life and a CT angiography may still be done. When non-obstructive mesenteric ischemia is suspected, the diagnosis should be based on clinical suspicion and TSA is the most reliable method to verify this diagnosis. Treatment of acute mesenteric ischemia, initial resuscitation and critical care, treatment of non-obstructive uh, non ROMI will be dealt with later. Surgical treatment and endovascular treatment. In surgical treatment, there is embolectomy. There may be the need for an SMA bypass and the assessment of bowel viability and resection, all of which we will see in the subsequent slides. There may be the use of hybrid procedures or endovascular treatment as well. Initial resuscitation, initial resuscitation is always the first choice of treatment in which fluid resuscitation due to bowel ischemia, which leads to significant fluid shifts and fluid sequestration in the bowel lumen. Nasogastric decompression must be done. This will help decrease the intraluminal pressure and also minimize the reduction of blood to the bowel wall. Electrolyte imbalances should be corrected. CVP, urine output, and arterial pressures should be monitored. Due to bacterial translocation, broad-spectrum antibiotics, heparinization of patient and also to avoid vasopressors as these may worsen ischemia. Surgical options for treatment. The main goals are revascularization, assessment of bowel viability and resection of necrotic bowel. Endovascular therapies are an option if there is no evidence of bowel ischemia and obvious bowel ischemia definitely needs surgery. Revascularization should always be done before bowel resection, and the bowel must be re examined after blood flow is stored. If infrapancreatic SMA, the infrapancreatic SMA can be exposed based on the need, that is, whether an embolectomy needs to be done or a bypass, with or without mobilization of the fourth part of the shall see. 
and preparation of the patient for surgery should include both ties in case a vein graft is needed for harvest. And the approach is always through a midline laparotomy. If an SMA embolectomy is to be done, a midline laparotomy, after which the omentum transfers colon and small bowel should be moved to the right side of the abdomen and packed, a transverse incision at the base of the colon in the mesentery. The vein is usually encountered first and the artery is found to the left at the base of the mesentery, covered by a plexus of lymphatics. Proximal exposure of the artery can be done by gentle upward retraction of the lower part of the pancreas. Proximal SMA between the middle and right colic branches is isolated. After heparinization of the patients, a transverse arteriotomy can be done. Distal embolectomy with a two or three French Fogarty catheter. Proximal venting is preferred to embolectomy, and the milking of the clot can also be attempted to prevent damage to the smaller branches of the artery. A one time installation of thrombolytic agents into the distal vessels can also be done. Closure is, is either primarily or with a vein patch. If an embolectomy is unsuccessful and there is need for an SMA bypass, the lateral peritoneum is opened down over the iota and onto the left common iliac artery. Peritoneal soilage and the sustainability of an inflow vessel is the main deciding factor for and for the, for, to the type of bypass that is done. Single vessel bypass is preferred in an emergency setting and the graft orientation is based on the atherosclerosis and occlusive disease of the inflow vessel. A lazy C lie of the graft, either from the right or left common iliac or distal iota, can all be used, and an end to end graft to SMA anastomosis can be done. A short retrograde iota SMA bypass may also be done with a larger graft. However, kink after the retractors are removed is a problem in this pass, in this procedure. Anticate bypass from supraceliac iota is also an option, but in an emergency setting, supraceliac exposure and clamping iota is rather difficult. The graft for these cases ideally would be a good quality vein, but a 6 to 8 mm dacron or externally supported PTFT can also be used with an omental flap cover or a rifampicin soaked daphron graft in contaminated settings. Assessment of bowel viability should be done about 20 to 30 minutes after reposition. Pulsation, color, peristalsis, and bleeding from the cut edges are all signs of bowel viability. This can be combined with Doppler sig signals at the anti mesentric border of the bowel, which gives better results. If available, fluorescent dye is accurate, but as we said before, needs special equipment. Reassessment is always advised when revascularization of the bowel is done and to assess the amount of bowel that needs to be resected. Minimal resection of non viable bowel and delayed anastomosis to a second relook procedure is now the mainstay and advised procedures. The decision for a relook laparotomy is made at the initial surgery. It does not change irrespective of the clinical outcome or improvement of the patient and should be done 12 to 48 hours after the initial procedure. Resection of non viable bowel and anastomosis usually is done at the second procedure. Reassessment of revascularization and abdominal closure. Endovascular options in acute settings could be catheter based thrombolysis and chemical thrombectomy which is done in a few centers with varying results. Thrombolysis takes long and is not always advised if bowel viability is in question, as bowel necrosis can occur within a few hours if circulation is not re-established. It is technically more difficult and more time consuming than an open epilepsy. Bowel viability cannot be assessed and the patient may still need a laparotomy, which and bowel non-viability is the main cause of mortality in these patients. In subacute and chronic conditions, endovascular have a better outcome. 
especially in surgically high risk patients. Thrombotic acute mesenteric ischemia, since the occlusion is at the origin or the first three to six centimeters of the SMA, they have a better role with a better outcome with endovascular procedures. Endovascular procedures are technically more difficult and the results in an acute setting are not favor favorable even when stenting is done. Hybrid options or the retrograde open mesenteric stenting ROMs is an open interventional approach in patients who are too sick for a bypass. Midline laparotomy and exposure and control of the SMA at the root of the transverse mesocolon are done. Thrombo and needed and a patch plasty over which a retrograde direct cannulation the flexible sheath placement towards the iota. Here the lesion is always crossed because of close proximity and direct visualization and then a balloon expandable stent is deployed. Morbidity and mortality is much less than with open bypass. These stenosis of stents are known and close follow-up is recommended with percutaneous treatment at a later date if needed. Another condition that we need to mention is spontaneous visceral dissection, which is a rare condition where a patient presents with abdominal pain, but intestinal angina and weight loss chronic cases is also reported. It may also be an incidental finding on a CT and can be diagnosed with an MRA, angiography, and also with duplex ultrasonography. Risk factors include male patients, atherosclerosis, hypertension, connective tissue disorder, vasculitis, and trauma. It is usually seen more in males and in the sixth decade of life. 50% of these patients will also have aneurysmal dilatation of the SMA. Clinically spontaneous dissections may range from being asymptomatic to catastrophic bowel ischemia or aneurysmal rupture. Treatment options for these conditions range from conservative management to anticoagulation, endovascular stenting, or the need for open surgical repair. Conservative management has only a 50% success rate and anticoagulation only 65% success rate. Endovascular stenting for symptomatic patients and in those with aneurysm greater than 2 centimeters, anticoagulation for failed stenting and open surgery for unsuccessful anticoagulation, a stepwise approach is recommended. Asymptomatic and symptomatic patients can be regularly followed up with short course of anticoagulation and lifelong antiplatelet therapy if there is no mesenteric ischemia. Coming to non obstructive mesenteric ischemia, mesenteric ischemia in the absence of a structural vessel occlusion may occur in low flow states, most commonly owing to poor cardiac output in critically ill hospitalized patients. Recent cardiac surgery and hemodialysis patients are at highest risk for developing this type of eccentric ischemia. Vasospasm following elective revascularization is a less common cause. The older mean age of this population due to their severe medical comorbidities makes this patient, this group of patients at a higher risk for mesenteric ischemia. The pathophysiology of this type is mainly due to vasospasm in the distribution of the SMA. 20% of acute mesenteric ischemia and the highest mortality is seen in this group due to associated multi-organ failure. It is hypothesized that cardiac failure, peripheral hypoxemia, paradoxical splanchnic vasospasm, and reperfusing injury all contribute to its development. Excessive sympathetic activity due to cardiogenic shock and hypovolemia leads to vasospasm of the visceral arteries to maintain cerebral and cardiac perfusion. Vasopressin and angiotensin are the neurohumoral mediators in these conditions. Vasospasm may continue even after the initiating insult is corrected. The exact mechanism of this is not known. <clears throat> and mesenteric ischemia and reperfusion is reperfusion ischemia is also seen in such patients. The frequency and duration of ischemic episodes seems to affect 
the reperfusion injury. Episodic reperfusion primes the ischemic tissue with leukocytes that react and there is a production of reactive oxygen species. They usually have an insidious onset and are seen critically ill hospitalized ICU patients. Investigations, angiography is usually the diagnostic investigation of choice, but should not be performed until the patient has been adequately resuscitated because hypotension or hypovolemia will demonstrate similar findings on angiography. There are four diagnostic criteria that are required on angiography for the diagnosis, the narrowing of the origins of multiple branches of the SMA, alternate dilatation and narrowing or the string of sausages sign of the intercellular branches, spasm of the mesenteric arcades and impaired filling of intramural vessels. Treatment is mainly medical with critical care management and arteriography. Surgery is only for peritonitis and non-viable bowel. Direct angiographic infusion of intra-arterial vasodilators is also recommended. The papaverin being used. Heparinization is also done and a check angiogram must be done at the end of the procedure. The treatment of choice is catheter guided papaverin infusion of the SMA an initial bolus of 30 milligram followed by an infusion of 30 to 60 milligram per hour for 24 hours is recommended. There are certain studies that have reported the use of papaverin for up to five days without complications. Cardiac support needs to be uh, given for the general improvement of such patients. Um, a repeat angiogram must be done to determine if the spasm has improved and vascular perfusion has returned to normal. Thank you.